for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Eric Johamstaller. He's the founder and CEO of Vivaldi Group. On the show today, we talk a lot about his new book, The Interaction Field, The Revolutionary New Way to Create Shared Value for Businesses, Customers, and Society. We talk about what an interaction field is, how they work, how brands are built using them, and what it means for business models. We talk a little bit about the intersection, if you will, between purpose and profit making, um, and how interaction fields might be an actual relatively model that could bridge the two. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Eric Yalhamstaller. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Well, something we've really never talked about. We've talked a number of times over the phone. How did you make your way from Germany to Kansas? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. My children ask me that. Uh, you too. And, uh, I, when I graduated, I, everyone said, so what job are you going to take now? And uh, I go like, why take a job? You know, my grandfather always said, you know, the, the success in life is to minimize the time between graduation and retirement. <laughs> and so I said, let's go study. And I desperately, I was at the University of Frankfurt at, uh, studying economics and computer science. And I saw in the bulletin board an announcement to study in Paris or in the United States. In Kansas was the, the Exchange University with a full scholarship for one year. And in a hurry, I applied and I went to the U.S. <laughs> in hindsight, I'm not sure Paris versus Kansas. I have nothing against Kansas, but like that's a very, very different choice. <laughs> I lived before in Paris. And uh, so I, I knew France very well. I, I, I was born at the border. French was my second language. English wasn't really existing at the time. And I, I convinced an English professor that with the, this French I know, the German I know, and my grades, by the time I arrive in Kansas, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll figure it out. So, so I arrived with pretty limited English knowledge and uh, and uh, and a duffel bag and a tennis racket. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Well, what what led you from academia to ultimately founding uh, Bavaldi? Yeah, you know, I got stuck in academics. Uh, Kansas was was more than I expected. I, it was the most amazing place most nurturing place. And I, my, when I finished an, a master's degree, when somebody told me I should do a PhD and I go like, holy shit, I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> that was something for me at least. And, and then as soon as I finished or got close to graduation, somebody says you should become a professor. And so then I, I dragged it on for 15 years. I loved the academics a lot. I loved teaching. And when you do this for 15, 20 years and what happened, is you realize that you are like an architect who keeps writing a blueprint and never sees the house go up. You, know, you just keep writing blueprints and how frustrating can it be? So, so I said, you know, I go to New York. If I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. <laughs> that was a stupid song. You know? It's not that easy to make it in New York. Anyway, a good song, of course. And, and, and so I, that's how I left academics and, and, and camped out here in New York. Gotcha. How do you talk about what, I mean, Vivaldi is kind of hard to sum up, frankly. How do you think about it? Like, how do you describe what you guys do? I mean, what gets me really excited is, is we help companies find new growth, new brand directions, new positionings. And, and the good news is that we have new business models, new innovation. And this is the tough part. You know, it's easy to run the operations of a company. It's a lot harder to mobilize the organization, a company to, to what new, very new, new directions. And, and, and we, we get, we get permission from clients to do some amazing stuff and, and reposition a company, rebrand or to enjoy, go in entire new directions, new, New, new markets. And, and the good news is, unlike maybe a consulting firm or some of the top consulting firm, MBV, McKinsey, BCG, and Bain, what we make a difference is that we actually make it happen. 
we actually, we are marketing people, we brand people, we launch something for a client and we see how it works and then turn it over. So it's, uh, we, are, we are very hands-on. We are not sort of the, the talkers. We are actually the doers. So it's a beautiful thing. The architects and the builders. And the builders. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, congrats on the new book, uh, The Interaction. Yeah, the, so it's titled The Interaction Field, The Revolutionary New Way to Create Shared Value for Businesses, Customers, and Society. So a question about, I've asked most authors that come on the show is, why this book and why now? I have a few thoughts. One is, I just feel that I felt about five, seven years ago that there's a new way of creating value, of driving new growth for companies. And the traditional way is to push out a product, a service, or if you will, an experience. Uh, create a BMW, create a Mercedes, and, and consumers would buy that. And, and that's, still, that's still happening today in some ways, even though the car market is going down, as an example. We don't just need products anymore. So what happens is in about seven years ago, there was an, a Nobel Prize winning uh, professor who talked about marketplaces and networks. And, and, it says, and it says that the value is not created anymore by supplying products on the supply side. The value shifts now to the demand side where the consumers are and, and through networks and uh, marketplaces. And I, that was for me a pivotal moment where I said, if that is really true, then the way we brand, the way we drive innovation, the way we drive new growth, is has the, the way we drive competitive advantage is entirely new or will change. And that's how I got in there. And I, I feel like there's these models out there, platforms called digital ecosystems. And I felt like some of these, there are some shortcomings to these models. And I wanted to see whether there's a better way to do it. And that's how the the book came about. Uh, well, let's start with the, a few definitions, if you will. Like, what is an interaction field? So we all live in an interaction field, if you will. You know, we all connect midnight to midnight, when one thousand four hundred forty minutes today globally, literally. And uh, even when you switch switch off your the light, you know, the, the, the your mobile phone still records <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> I just so 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 we are all connected there globally. There's this hyper connectivity. And so there's an interaction field and a company, in my opinion, needs to make a decision of what is that interaction field they participate, what network or platform or ecosystem they are building in order to drive new growth and competitive advantage. So that's, that's to me an interaction field. It's, it's almost, if you would think, uh, it's a hybrid model of a traditional business model of, let's say, a pipeline or value chain, and it combined that with, with an, a, a platform, an ecosystem, or some form of a network. Okay, gotcha. And if I think about it, I mean, like an example that would come to mind uh, might be like Uber, as an example, where you've got supply side, the riders, the demand side, the drivers, and then they're you know right in the middle. I'm guessing that's what you call the nucleus. The nucleus. Yeah, that's that's a nucleus. That's what's a, more or less a platform. I call a nucleus. Uh, and you know what? What sort of the, the, what we know now? It is in the old days was we get the drivers, we get them the cars. And then we have them drive around New York City and pick up people on the street, right? That's the supply side. That's easy, you know, and well, not easy, but you need to have a lot of money for buying the medallion license and then for buying the cars and a repair shop and all sorts of stuff. A friend of mine had, unfortunately, a lot of, lot of medallions, more than a thousand medallions and he's suffering quite, quite greatly. The problem is in this, in order to, what's sort of new is, is that now value is not just created on that demands, on that supply side, on a better better service, let's say, or better drivers, uh, more friendly drivers, more, and so forth. But it's on the, on the demand side, namely the riders. You also have to get the riders. You, you have to manage these two pieces. That sort of makes, it, makes this, this new business model so exciting. So you don't have any, you get, and it, it sort of, it's a chicken and an egg question, you know, like, what do you get first? Do you get the drivers or you get the rider? Or do you riders and drivers? It's sort of, you have to manage that in a very uh, proactive way. Yeah, but I think that the taxi slash Uber example is a pretty interesting one because we talked before about the barriers of entry. You know, like you said, if you have enough money, you could you know, supply yellow cabs all around the city and basically like monopolize and blanket the market. 
There used to be the money, assets, some other sort of cash, really literally, or investors that help you to build a business. And today, money doesn't, doesn't pay you any more this. Today, on the demand side, you know, what does it say? Money doesn't buy you love. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so if, you, if you, your money doesn't buy you enough consumers or riders, you know, they, they have the option of uh, with an one and a half inch on their phone, they switch to Lyft or they take a taxi or they have alternatives. So just money or advertising or communicating a great service alone is not getting, getting you love. As consumers. So. What do you think led to these interaction fields, you know, popping up and, and becoming such a massive influence? You know, what, what happened is uh, two, uh, around 2004, two French economists sort of theorized around that, that in 2014, these two, one of the two French uh, professors, academics at Université de Toulouse, uh, actually won the Nobel Prize on this. And, but it wasn't until the end of the last decade, uh, so 2000, around 2000, 10 or 2008, when people realized that a number of technologies come together, they all mature more or less at the, at the same time. And they, draw, they make this demand side, this consumer side so powerful. I actually call this the second wave of connectivity or the second wave uh, that if the first wave was in about around 95 when Amazon came and invented more or less e-commerce you know, and buying books online. Then the second wave is 2008, 2009, mobile phones, smartphones, everybody has that. That was a significant change. And of course, the social networks that came about. But there were many other technologies at the time. You know, like today, we have, today is the third wave of that, you know, and uh, AI, AI, ML, machine learning, and all of those technologies we have today, they all, if you, you can interpret it whichever way you want, they all conspire to make this hyper connectivity. And that creates, that has now helped companies to say, hey, this is, there is an enormous bucket of creating value and, and, and driving new growth. We just need to get really good at that on that demand side. And companies like my company, Vivaldi, is, is right focused on that for the, for 20 some years now, understanding how consumers connect and everybody else connects in, in sort of this world. Do I have to, if, if I'm a brand owner or business leader, do I have to own a platform like an Uber or an Amazon to be successful? Or are there other ways in which I can participate? Yeah, you don't really have to. In, if you're strictly speaking, if you can find a market like the old days and protect that market by creating barriers of entry so that nobody can really challenge you, you can have an annuity, a, a profit number to your business for a long, long time. The problem is that technology is, the, uh, the annoying part of technology is that technology actually reduces those opportunities to create barriers of entry. They make everything sort of accessible to everybody. And so what happens is, so you you can have for some years a business that, that drives just by positioning yourself in the marketplace. But over time, you will realize that value creation is, uh, innovation is required. And that value creation just doesn't happen anymore just by producing a new product. You know, there are, I, uh, there are you know, for every mattress company that you hear, and yes, we talk about Caspa a lot, but, you know, there's 175 others out there for every meal kit solution. There is about 155 other meal kit solutions out there. So it is, at, even if you have a great idea, let's say a meal kit solution or a mattresses over the, over the uh, direct to consumer, you, you, it's not, it's short lived. It's a few years and then you need to figure out another play. And the answer to that is, is own, if you will, the interaction field or if you own the network or the platform or the, the marketplace, because consumers are part of that. I mean, the more you talk about this concept and, and how it plays out, it's really a business model question, it, it seems. And I'm curious, like, what, what are the types of business models that you see or maybe some examples? And like, what's the brand implication of that story? Yeah, that's a very good question. The, the, think, of, think about it. And a good example, maybe, maybe think of hamburgers. You know, it's a, it's a little early for that, but think of there's good breakfast at McDonald's. 
But think of McDonald's. McDonald's is a is is a traditional call a pipeline business model. Uh, they have a good hamburger, the, the Big Mac. They have uh, uh, over the years they added drive through that makes it easier, convenient. There is good service, uh, reasonably good service, and and a very good meal on the road. And it changes slightly the menu. Now think about think about how how McDonald's evolves. Now they started they start mobile ordering. Right with a mobile phone, you know, because that's sort of the new thing, especially here in the pandemic. Now, what ha- what happens? Now, when you with mobile ordering, you can also add to that delivery through maybe Uber or some other service, you know, DoorDash or something like that, uh, some service. So now everything, if you just think of it as, oh, you know, they add some technology to that or some, they do some digitalization. Now I can order. Then you really miss the point because what happens is. When you really look at it very carefully, is McDonald's also evolves their business model because until now the business model was best location, right? Sort of where you are is, is important. Uh, the kind of menu you have a fixed menu that you get standard menu, the standard burger at every place on on things. You get it at a standard price because wherever you are, it's the same three ninety nine for your hamburger and the fries or whatever something like that, and so forth and so forth. You have to set it's all standardized. But when you now, what I'm just when you think about it now, things change totally because now for the first time, McDonald's has a direct connection with a consumer. They actually with a mobile phone in the act can in the act with a consumer. Marketing changes totally. Doesn't have to be on TV anymore. They can connect with directly. They collect data on a daily basis. They could collect data where you travel to. They don't even some fundamental assumptions change. Namely location doesn't matter anymore because you don't you don't you actually have it delivered. You order it mobile. The menu can change your menu can change to my menu, Alan. The menu changes. Everything changes. See, this can be a fundamental change from one business model to another business model. So from in this case, it goes from a platform business model, from a, from a pipeline model, from a traditional value chain model to a, pipe, a, a platform model. Now, because they have a direct interaction with consumers. Now, then you then McDonald's can say, well, we could sell many other things to people that also uh, go for lunch. You know, we could we could have other suppliers that also that I invite, and then it becomes an ecosystem. That's an, still another business model, and on and on and on. So, a small change, if you look at it right, like a small change, like mobile ordering. Yes, it's a technology enabled uh, solution, but can fundamentally change the entire business of of McDonald's that's the evolution that companies are taking place so there are there are these multiple business models and that have emerged due to technology uh, particular digital technology and, and this is what I try to explain in the book how you can use those in order to drive new growth I like that example you know a pipeline business moving to a platform curious if you have an example we could talk about around the ecosystem like taking it that step further if you will you know, think about it. I mean, I, I in my chapter one, I have I actually use McDonald. I, I'm sorry, uh, John Deere. I love John Deere. I, I grew up in a small village around a lot of farms, and John Deere is the greatest brand of all in the tractor business. And John Deere always has said, you know, as long as it has my name, you know, you're gonna get on on it. You're gonna have a quality tractor because the tractor is what the farmer's major utility tool. Or tool, if you will, to to do to, to do farming. But you also know that if you really want to create for farmers today, just more precise cutting or just putting some bells and whistles on a tractor, you know, like a, maybe a screen, a Netflix screen or something like that, so the the farmer doesn't bore himself to death. You know, you know, you know, on the field, you know, going over and over and over again. So, so when you think about it, you know, a John Deere example, if they really want to solve the problems for of farming, namely increase the productivity of the farm or, or increase the profitability of a farm, they are not going to do it with a better tractor. What they can do, though, is think about it. And that's what's actually happening in this. I describe it in the book. You actually can today drop sensors on the field, 
very inexpensive sensors. The, the tractor can do that. You can do it with a drone. You collect those, those data points from those sensors, namely data points like what's the irrigation on the plant, what's the soil condition, and on and on, what's the condition of the plant. What's, you can add those data. There are 100,000 farmers participating in the John Deere Open Platform, it's called. They aggregate the data. They also aggregate, some of them also aggregate real profitability data. So farm operations data. Uh, you can add to that weather data. And if you now look at the data set, this data set can take place every day. They can be uploaded because they are sensors. They, so it's a total interaction field between the farmer and, and this platform. If now John Deere shares those data with the fertilizer companies and the crop companies, they can say in Iowa, in that square foot, there is a plant that requires, there is a, a let's say, a soil condition, which would give, create optimal yield of crop, if you will, if you use that kind of a crop uh, from Bayer, let's say, or Monsanto uh, formerly, and it would, it would require that kind of a fertilizer and so forth and so forth. So if you build around a platform and ecosystem of participants, that's why I call it an interaction field, they interact, they share data, they create value for the farmers, beyond what you imagine. Right now, the average productivity in the U.S., very, U.S. are very profitable farms relative to worldwide, is around 3,500 kilo per hectare. It is estimated right now 10% increase is huge, is hardly attainable right now in the, in the farm field. If you follow the logic that I was just describing, the expectation is that productivity can double to 7,850 kilos per hectare. So it's a, of, of cereal. So it's a huge benefit benefit, not only for the farmer who has a profitability, but for every player, for every participant in the interaction field, even for the world, because we think that with the, with the world population rising to, to so many more billion by 2050, the food supply is not sufficient under current conditions. And, and this would actually resolve or solve for very big issues in you know, world hunger, better cereals, higher quality food. Because you can also manage uh, the, the field or a plant, you know, by in terms of the kind of fungi they will look at, the kind of uh, insects that uh, attack sort of the crop. And so there's a lot of things that can. So when everybody participates in an interaction field, not just some self-serving companies that says, oh, the two or three together work together to make money, but when every, everybody works, even agricultural professors at the agricultural universities, if they look at the real data from the field, you know, then I think everybody benefits. Yeah, I mean, I really like that example, and the and frankly, the pivot from you know the McDonald's uh, the pipeline, the platform, and then the John Deere is essentially platform to ecosystem. This notion of shared value you talked about you know everyone is benefiting throughout the ecosystem like that's a big mind shift right like like it's almost like i i can't be thinking as a business leader about just pure profit maximization but like how does everyone win is that fair yeah hey you know look uh, alan where are we today you know we i think that we all realize that in today's age we especially the pandemic brings this more to the front you can't Nobody does it alone. You got to, you need, you know, connections, collaborations, participation, I call, is really, is really where, where things are. Think of the, just go back to the same example, John Deere. Yes, the farmers will benefit, and that's a good thing. But we're also solving some major industry problems. 40% of water that is used in agriculture never reaches the plant due to loss and due to many other reasons. And that's an inefficiency that really is not affordable anymore. It's a friction. It's an industry friction. We look on the side. And then you can do this with every other industry. You can do it with healthcare. You can do it with, with automotive. They, there are frictions in the industry and that we never have been able to solve by building an interaction field company where everybody participates. You have now a business model that actually an, on an operating model that actually drives shared value for everyone, including society, you know, in, in the example of John Deere with World Hunger. So I like very much the talk, you know, the maximizing shareholder value is no longer, the Milton Friedman world is no longer the thing we now need to have, stakeholder capitalism, you know, a shared value. It's not a real conversation because if you are the CEO 
of a publicly traded company or privately traded company, if you don't create shareholder value or maximize that, you don't have a job. And, you know, CEOs oftentimes have a quarterly job performance report, as you well know. So that's not a good idea unless that shared value idea also has some real, I mean, real, real, I don't know how you call this, uh, you know, some real, real legs to it. And those legs is what I call the interaction field company, the interaction field model. If you create those interactions and the governance to it, the, and the architecture so that everybody benefits, then I think then, then you create shared value and it's not just talk, it's actually also work. Yeah, we've had a number of guests and, and you know, in the trade press, purpose in marketing and, and purpose-driven businesses has gotten tons and tons of talk, like you're mentioning. It does seem like this idea is putting Milton Friedman back into purpose. <laughs> you know, like, yes, that's right. <laughs> And making sure that it makes economic sense, not just good humanity sense. That's right. Yeah. Purpose is again that, that's the biggest the biggest problem, you know, you, you mentioned is there's a lot of good thought with purpose, but I think it requires purpose needs a business model and and nobody has come up with that these days. And hopefully this my book helps in, in provide that approach to get to that. Awesome. Well, I've enjoyed talking about the book, but I want to switch gears a little bit. We, t we love to get to know the person behind the microphone on the show. And um, my favorite question, frankly, to ask is, has there been an experience of your past that defines and makes up who you are today? <laughs> That's a good one. You know, I, I don't know. I think that there are so many. I, I, don't, I don't even know what there would be. I think that, I don't know, the, the, perhaps the, when I came from Germany, Maybe that's a good, we talked, we started at the beginning of the show. When I was in Germany, everybody always sort of like, the, the sentiment was, and it was always, you need to prove yourself, you're not good enough. And I, and we, when you're at the university, you, you, you sort of like live up to the professor and to the expectation of your parents. And you, you're so always trying to chase uh, this this sense you're not good enough you need to do something when i came to america it was just the opposite what got me so motivated and excited and passionate in in the work i'm still doing today the same work is that people says oh my god you're amazing you are just so amazing you come from germany you're a mathematician you know <laughs> i was like not all germans are mathematicians no 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 you can do this you can do this and i think I think that to me, it is that well, the, the pivotal event has always been to me that, that positive disposition that, that you find in this country. You know, it's like people say, like, yes, we can, and yes, we can, yes, we can. And I think, it's, it, I think that has carried me for, for a long time. And I, I think it goes a long way to what this country has achieved in some ways. And, and uh, especially now in the pandemic, you know, we think it's a good, a good, good memory, a reminder. In a, in a way that that this this I think that has defined me that the encouragement that, that the positive reinforcement that people give even when a book is a book comes out now somebody writes me an email you know I I'm still or look at a few emails a day and I see somebody saying something about the book I get totally psyched about it it's just you know, it's a beautiful thing yeah no that's awesome what advice would you give your younger self back in Germany if you're starting all over again. <laughs> I think I think people who know me they 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 say Eric you've grown you you are no longer the young guy you're one of the oldest now in the company and what they always say is is like where do you get the energy from you know there was this one guy I gave a presentation in Atlanta he says I loved your presentation I loved your presentation I wish I could present like you but just tell me what's the blue pill that you take to 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 do a presentation like that I go like no blue pill <laughs> it's just what I enjoy doing. So I think my younger self, and I, and I went through some, I think, you know, I went through computer science. I went through various job, jobs that I thought would be my thing. And I, I sort of sampled like an, like in, through internships, a, a youth thing. But I found early on where I really find my passion. So my, my suggestion is, you know, take all the time you need in order to, Make a pivot early on in your career. It's okay, you know. Things will find it work out. And I think that finding that that passion point 
that thing that carries you for many years to come. You know, just just where you say like, oh, this in that combination, I could be successful. I could find enjoyment. You know, put love where your labor is, and then you work all your life very hard, and actually, and you enjoy that a lot more than doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's funny you've had other people point it out that your energy is infectious. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. so, you know um, it is true. Like every time we get on the phone to talk to each other, I mean, it's just like you're, you're ready to go. It's like the Energizer Bunny's been released. You know? <laughs> oh, great. yeah, yeah. <laughs> great. Well, um, this new question I've been adding lately, it's a little silly, but sometimes it's interesting building my shopping list based on what people say. Uh, curious if there's been an impactful purchase that you've made, say, over the last year of $100 or less. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. I have a short term memory, I have to say. So, but I, I just, maybe that's, I just picked up a book. I had a discussion over the weekend with a friend, and, and the discussion was uh, how successful, what is the contribution of Einstein, Albert Einstein? Because I read the book, I tried to figure out relativity theory. He decided that I'm, I can't figure it out anymore. <laughs> I'm not good enough for that part of the way of thinking. And we discussed about this, and then talent he had. And there's this book out there which I bought, uh, which by, by his, his wife, his first wife, Mileva. And uh, Malik and uh, Mileva Malik, there was some sort of discovery in 1986 around when when they when they found that sort of her life was sort of described or papers came out of how what she she really did, and you know, and I always thought it was. I always knew that Einstein was this guy that 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 was good at at mental experiments, sort of thought experiments. Then he had his friend Marcel was his name, uh, who who did a lot of the lab work for him. But I also learned in this book that that Maleva, Mileva actually did a lot of the mathematical equations for Einstein. So she was the mathematician behind him, and I thought. I thought that is sort of interesting. So this, you remember, we, I, I mentioned this earlier in the show, nobody does it alone. It's neither in business. And, and I think this, it makes me think really, you know, that we're all sort of connected in some ways and it's through this global connectivity, even more so. It's, and, and, and now also in the pandemic, pandemic we realize that, that I think the biggest learning lesson is that when, if you become successful, you have a lot of people along the way that help. And, and you know, I also saw this wonderful statement just now is, is for, by RBG, you know, the, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She says something like, pursue something that you have a passion about, but make sure that you can, but you will be a success when you can bring a lot of people along. With. And I, I thought it was a really good, that's in the same spirit. So, so I think this is sort of like makes a big impact for me. The, the thinking these days of uh, what, became, what makes a book successful. You know, there are a lot of people who help at, at, at my company, Vivaldi, and outside. And in almost everything I do, it's, it's mind boggling how, how little it is me drives these things anymore. And a lot of people sort of like give you a helping hand. Right. No, that's very insightful. I want to end on kind of two more marketing-ish questions, if you will. Curious if there are you know, brands or companies or causes that you just personally take notice of or you think other people should, should notice what they're up to. Well, I find, you know, the uh, com brands and companies, I find these companies like Alibaba, for example, incredibly uh, exciting. And the reason why I like them so much is, is because one of the things is that Alibaba started out when there was no infrastructure for commerce, then there was no infrastructure for cash, there was no infrastructure for log logistics in, in China, let's say. And they are not in this business of we are competing, we are disruption, we are destroying the competition. You know, these, you, these other ones are totally irrelevant and they don't know, they're too old and, 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 and we have a better model. It's just the opposite. There are 6 million retailers in small shops, very small mom and pop shops in, in China. And Alibaba gives them free software 
in order to be and then teaches them how to become part of a of a network and and sell across the rest of China even globally. So it isn't about destroying Main Street, you know, because oh we have a digital model, we have an online shop, it's much cheaper here. No, it, they actually build on the top of it. They build the infrastructure. They also created a logistics system. Now the most successful, the biggest IPO is, is, uh, that is coming up here is Ant Financial. And Ant Financial is an Alibaba. It's part of uh, Alipay, which is the, 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 the financial, the, the, the money uh, infrastructure that they built because the Chinese consumers wasn't comfortable with credit and with credit cards. They, everything was a cash society at the time. And they built uh, Ant Financial and now it's one of the biggest IPOs. It's just a small part of the business, still huge. So I find that very interesting that people, that the whole world is changing from competition and disruption this 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 high t- testosterone sort of thinking of we need to crush somebody in order to be successful to a model of engagement participation interaction in the action field and actually create those shared values we talked about earlier and that's that's why i'm interested and and you know they also don't have to advertise they are not the ones that say like oh we are better faster cheaper or something like the brand the brand alibaba is in is you wake up in the morning you don't even have to go to the app because you, the app is actually Alibaba is is actually um, that they, they have sort of software so it also deeply integrates in consumers' life and the brand the way it builds as a brand is not by by communicating a a, a purpose what they what they're doing it and I like a lot more doing than just talking you know so anyway <laughs> <laughs> no I, it's an interesting model and definitely um nothing negative about amazon but if you just compare the two it's, it's a very different approach yes it's a very different approach amazon is uh, successful in their own rights but i think it's worthy alan to, to compare the two companies just in terms of the in terms of their their success you know alibaba is three times larger in gmv uh, cross merchandising volume than 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 uh, amazon so so it's there's a there's there's huge success attached to it yeah no for sure well last question for you what do you feel like is the biggest opportunity or the largest threat that marketers are facing today I have been around for a long time, Alan, and and uh, in in I've seen all of these shifts. And years ago, the, the uh, and I I think that right now the shift ha- is never has been as significant as I've seen it today. And and again, it's, it is three these new ways of engagement uh, that that consumers have. I think the consumers never consumers we always have talked about that you need to be consumer centric but that used to be the idea that i i study consumers i do a segmentation and i listen to consumers i hire a voice of the consumer market research firm and i listen on a daily basis or constantly i listen to social media that's was that was customer centricity is and i think today i think things have changed totally because, and, and we used to own the brand. We called it a brand owners. That's also no longer valid. <laughs> you, know, that, you know, who owns the brand these days? So, it, so there's a massive shift on consumers. With that comes changing consumer expectations. And, and I think customer centricity has a totally new meaning because, because, because it's consumers who, it's again, where I think is where value is creation rather than by pushing out a better product because I, I have a voice of the customer initiative in place. So I think there's this massive shift in from the, the traditional branding to branding. You're not branding any more product. You're branding an entire ecosystem. You're branding an entire interaction field. That's a lot more difficult than than just uh, looking at your product and look at the, the functional emotional benefits of that. So, so I think that that's that's what I think is the where I look at right now the biggest shift in in, uh, in in marketing. I love it. Well, Eric, it's always a joy to talk to you. So, thank you for uh, spending time with me today. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, you have an incredible uh, series here with some incredible speakers and uh, participants and uh, conversations. So, I'm glad I'm, I can join you. Oh, thank you. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners, and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. 
There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.